Okay, so let, let me begin by thanking the staff at 3CT, Anna Searle Jones and Carlo Diaz, who are indispensable to the life and health of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory. And I'm Lisa Wedeen, a co-director at the center. Uh, thanks as well to Joe Bonney and Devlina Mukherjee for managing the technical challenges of producing an event like this. Uh, I would also like to express my gratitude towards our co-sponsors, the Arab Studies Institute and the 10 Years On Project and to Bassem Haddad in particular. A special thanks are also owed to Mary Kathleen Smith who manages to be everywhere at the ASI and to my colleagues more generally at Jed who are broadcasting our discussion on Facebook Live. I would like to thank the members of the Syria campaign for their willingness to broadcast the event live as well. And I hope we can meet in the not so distant future in person. Thanks are also owed to Professor Sophia Fenner, of Colorado College for her willingness to field questions. And thanks to the audience members, you guys, for taking time out of busy and bizarre days to listen to this conversation. And of course, a profound thank you to Muhammad al attar al Masalam, and Lina Sinjeb for, for being here today. I wish I could cook you all a wonderful dinner after this event, but hopefully we shall one day be able to get together in person for a proper meal. My appreciation to all of you for being here. A number of events marking the 10th anniversary of the Syrian revolution are taking place this week. Today, March 18th, is a particularly noteworthy day in this ongoing history. For as all Syrians know, but others may not, March 18th was the day that a group of Syrians in the southern town of Dara, in the immediate aftermath of Friday prayers, staged the town's first public protest in decades. Although certainly inspired by demonstrations in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, Bahrain, and Libya, the actual flashpoint for large-scale Syrian protest came in connection with the arrest of school children from Dara, who had written anti-regime graffiti on a school's walls a few weeks earlier. A few weeks earlier, yeah. Residents responded at first by marching on the governor's mansion and demanding the children's release, as word began circulating that the children were being tortured in detention. A week later on March 18th, security forces opened fire on a large crowd of protesters proceeding from Dara's main mosque after noon prayers. As the cycle of demonstrations and brutal crackdowns escalated, citizens from neighboring villages became engaged in confrontation until by March 25th, solidarity protests had spread uh, to neighboring villages and there was a remarkable amount of uh, uptake in other major areas of Syria, not simply the villages, Homs, Led, Iyye, Idlib, etc. Outrage over disclosures that the, Dara, that the Dara children were being mistreated in prison over the disrespect shown to elders attempting to negotiate their release and over the sheer unaccountability of the regime officials with links to the ruling family who were responsible for the children's treatment, all tapped into a reservoir of dissatisfaction with authoritarian caprice, official corruption, ongoing brutality, and the government's inattentiveness to suffering. The slogan chanted by protesters, or one of them, spirit with blood we sacrifice for you, ya dara, iruh bidam nafdiki ya dara, played on the regime slogan of sacrifice for Syria's leader, Biruh Bidam Nafdika Ya Bashar, substituting the tortured children for Bashar. This voicing of the national we in solidarity with the town where children had violated the norms of regime sanctioned behavior made the abused students the focal point of new political intensities in which acts of collective citizenship coalesced around a determination to resist tyranny by disrupting the status quo. It's hard to describe the exhilaration felt in those early days by people participating in the world-making experiences of protest. And the regime's efforts to squelch dissent seemed to embolden some Syrians to take to the streets calling for freedom and dignity, and ultimately to demand the toppling of the regime. As demonstrations gained momentum and the regime continued to respond with violence, the unvarnished essence of autocracy was laid bare. 
namely its reliance on coercive power to squelch unrest. The cycle of demonstrations and regime repression ultimately devolved into a more militarized struggle, intensified by international interference from numerous sides, the opposition's fragmentation, and the regime's willingness to pursue a scorched earth policy. At the time of the 10th anniversary now, the civil war that ensued has claimed the lives of over half a million people, with many more wounded, displaced, and forcibly disappeared. As Lina Sinjeb noted in a recent piece for the BBC, over 6 million Syrians in a population that used to number an estimated 21 million are now in exile. It is easy in this present context to give in to despondency and despair. These are heart-wrenching and depressing times. But as I've mentioned on other recent occasions, there's also reason for hope. At the risk of repeating myself, let me note the following. The revolutions of 2011 let a big fat genie out of the bottle as a cartoon from Kafrunbel Syria playfully noted early on. And even though people are beyond exhausted, especially in countries that have undergone major crackdowns or civil war, that genie is not going back in the bottle anytime soon. In light of what history has taught us, it's too early to think of the Arab revolutions of 2011 as over or failed. The French Revolution took 100 years. The ways contemporary commentators discuss the revolutions 10 years following 1789 or 1848 differ radically from the analyses scholars are able to write now with the advantage of a long durée perspective. Fittingly, author Leila Shami notes that today, March 18th, also commemorates the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune, when ordinary people took control of Paris, briefly organizing their lives around radical understandings of equality before being crushed by the French state. Although that vision was not realized, the experiment lives on with the French revolutions giving birth to one form of liberal democracy with all of its problems, promises, and limitations. In other words, rather than sounding death knells prematurely, it behoves us to tarry between past and future, to borrow Hannah Arendt's words, for it's too soon to know what the future will tell us about our recent past or our soon to be past present. To put it differently, and I cited this the other night as well, as the late Syrian activist and co-creator of cartoons in Kafran Ra'ed Faris once said, quote, the revolution is an idea and ideas never die, unquote. But ideas do change with the times. And in that spirit, 3CT is especially honored to have three extraordinary guests help us think through how theater, journalism, the visual arts and curatorial practices are creatively imagining futures in the context of circumstances changed from the ones confronting Syrian revolutionaries 10 years ago, changed by a soul shattering war, by ongoing economic collapse, exacerbated by the horrors of a global pandemic, by the experiences gained in exile and the people lost, by efforts to become unstuck from attachments that no longer do affirming work, by efforts to unmoor oneself from what my colleague and friend, Lauren Berlant, in a different context calls cruel optimism. Mohamed Latar is a Syrian playwright, a dramaturge, and an important chronicler of war-torn Syria. He studied English literature and, uh, at Damascus University and theatrical studies at the Higher Institute for Dramatic Arts in Damascus. He also holds an MA in applied drama from Goldsmiths University of London. His plays have been staged in many languages at international theaters and venues around the world. They include Withdrawal, 2007, Samah, 2008, Online, 2011. Could you please look into the camera, 2011 as well, which I had the privilege of translating for the TDR, an academic journal focusing on performance. A Chance Encounter, 2012, Intimacy, 2013, Antigone of Shatila, 2014, While I Was Waiting, 2016, Iphigenia, 
2017, Aleppo, A Portrait of Absence, 2017, The Factory, 2018, and Damascus, 2045-2019. El Attar has written as well for numerous magazines and newspapers with a special focus on the Syrian uprising since 2011. He's also a dear friend and a former guest of 3CT. His partnership with Omar Abu Sa'ad has produced trenchant analyses of current politics, sometimes creatively adapting plays such as Antigone to make them resonate in present day circumstances of trauma and dislocation, enlisting refugees as actors to raise anew the play's classical questions about daughterly obligation, political duty, trauma, and heroism and sometimes creating stories from the experiences of revolutionary solidarities or subsequent disappointment. In Could You Please Look Into the Camera, al Attar's account of the early, heady days of peaceful resistance does not shy away from complexity, especially the conundrums posed by generational disagreements and familial friction. Activist young people have a kind of consciousness of themselves in the play as being different from both their parents and from older siblings who were too complicit with the regime, raising questions about the bargains we all make to stay safe and the joyous camaraderie that can be experienced in those moments when we choose to live otherwise. While I Was Waiting is one of my favorites. It was performed at Lincoln Center in 2017, praised in the New York Times as a, quote, subtly harrowing play, unquote. It gets around certain of the problems bedeviling political theater by embracing failure and stasis as its central sub subjects. Quote, the failure of government, but also of the resistance, unquote, as the Times puts it. As one of the protagonists asks, how can nothing have changed after all that has happened? And as the New York Times points out, it's precisely this negotiation of stasis amidst calamitous disruption that makes the place so compelling. Themes I, I hope that in the conversation we can come back to. Alma Salem is a curator, cultural advisor, and the director of the Syrian women's political movement. Her career began at the Institut Francais du Proche Orient, IFPO, the French Institute for the Study of the Near East in Damascus, where she established the first digital image archive of the Levant, a heritage collection she also featured in her book, Photographie de Luan. She spent a second decade at the British Council, where she led its NINA Regional Arts Program. Her curated exhibitions tour internationally, appearing in London, Delhi, Paris, New York, Seattle, Amsterdam, and Brussels. Salem is an alumni fellow of the Arts Management Institute at Maryland University, located in Washington, DC. Her present project, Sirius Sixth Space, a contemporary art curatorial platform, is a, quote, independent, non-physical, contemporary art curatorial platform that extends notions of the real for artists and audiences, unquote. It is a pop-up media art gallery and alternative space for all Syrian artists and artists interested in Syria, she says. And it opens up, quote, spaces for digital arts, visual arts, and online disseminated media art, unquote, generating innovative responses to current events and provoking conversations aimed at challenging conventional narratives about arts and heritage. Lena Sinjeb is a prominent independent filmmaker and a freelance BBC Middle East correspondent based in Beirut. She contributes to several other international media outlets as well, including Newsweek and the New York Times. And she was a consulting senior fellow with Chatham House's Syria from Within. Sinjeb has covered, Sinjeb, excuse me, has covered the Syrian uprising extensively since its beginnings in 2011. In 2019, she produced and directed a film on the siege on Aleppo, Madness in Aleppo. In 2013, she directed a film about Syrian women during the uprising. Entitled Suriyat, the film was nominated for a One World Media Award. In May 2013, Sinjeb won the International Media Cutting Edge Award for her coverage of Syria. She she holds a degree in English from Damascus University and an MA in International Politics from SOAS, University of London. Her recent BBC short, The Syrian Conflict, Three Women, Ten Years On, features three women narrating their experiences resisting the Assad regime, their lives in exile or in one case within Syria, their hopes and disappointments, and the sorts of 
changes they have undergone over time. It's, it is remarkable uh, how much gets expressed in under four minutes here. So I highly recommend all of these works to you, certainly because they tell you important things about Syria, but also because they speak to abiding concerns about the relationship between politics and aesthetics. Marking the 10th anniversary of the Syrian uprising with a conversation among three artists, journalists, curators, allows us to discuss the struggle over narrativizing the revolutionary past and the challenges in the way of producing a sense of transforming uh, transformative ongoingness in the present. It also beckons us to consider the relevance of different forms and genres of artistic and journalistic expression, specifically here documentary and feature filmmaking, visual arts, theater curation, reportage, and cultural critique. Finally, it's my hope that our conversation today will shed light where it's needed and provide more general reflections on the relationships between aesthetics and radical politics. So thank you all for being here. It really means the world to me. And let me start by asking each of you to say something about how you view prevailing narratives about Syria, articulated in journalistic media and in the artistic areas in which you specialize. In other words, what do they get right? What do they get wrong? What kinds of narratives or ideas have been foreclosed that you think should be part of the conversation? And, and let me start with uh, Mohammed here, if you don't mind. Hi, Lisa. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's, um, it's a pleasure for me to be with you. Thank you for hosting and organizing this. It's a great pleasure also to be with Alma and Lina, uh, both uh, great uh, women that I always um, learn from their work. So it's, um, I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe directed to your question. Um, I'll try to brief, uh, to be brief as much as I can because it it is indeed, and I was happy that when when I mean this panel like was like uh, yeah come together because I think that topic of narrative is one of the uh, most important topic that uh, is is really occupying like Syrians uh, today, and and why is that? Uh, because uh, today, as you mentioned briefly, is is a very important day for Syrians. The day marks the 10th anniversary of the Syrian revolution against the Assad regime. Uh, but after 10 years, wh where are we today, actually? I mean, uh, um, and let's be honest and frank. Uh, the revolution um, that started in 2011 with a lot of hope, with uh, big dreams to achieve uh, freedom, social justice, and uh, democracy has been crushed. Our dreams has been brutally uh, crushed. We are defeated. 90% of Syrians today inside of Syria live under poverty line, 90%. This is not uh, science fiction, this is reality. Uh, Syria is on, uh, on the brink of starvation or maybe actually starvation started in Syria. Uh, one third of the population, one third of the population is displaced. Uh, we are uh, scattered, shattered, uh, exiled, yeah? So this is our reality today. So, and based, based on that, actually, based on, the, on all these kind of sad facts, narrative becomes more and more important because, because we are defeated, because our dream is defeated, because the revolution for democracy was defeated, I would say even temporarily, yeah? What, 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 what do we have today? I, I would say that we have our voice, we have our story. And I, I would claim that as long as you have a story, yeah, you are not totally defeated. You are not totally demolished. And this is actually not just that we know, actually our enemies know that. And that's why I think they are going after our story. They are going after our narrative. And that's why actually the struggle over narrative became today the main battlefield, I would say. And let me here just make a quick distinction between two types of struggle. I would say there is the struggle over narrative, and there is the struggle to create a new narrative. Uh, to speak about struggle over narrative, I would say that there are three fronts that Syrians are engaged in. And, and this engagement uh, actually has been happening since day one from the Syrian revolution, but of course, it became more intense and more fierce in the past few years. 
Uh, these three, three fronts briefly is first the regime and its backers, the Russians and the Iranians. And here I have to highlight the Russians because they have very strong propaganda machine. Because what is the main narrative now by the regime or, and its backers, or let me say the victorious on the ground? And we know very well that unfortunately, history generally is written by the victorious. Yeah? And what is now the official uh, narrative by the uh, regime and the Russians is that there was no revolution at all. There was no need for a revolution. There is no legitimacy, actually, for a public movement against the regime. From day one, there was uh, 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 terrorist actions, and there were some agents in Syria who are working to serve some foreign agendas who tried to destabilize the country and to try to topple this regime. So this is the narrative now by the regime and its backers, and it's being imposed very strongly uh, internally and externally. The second actually front for the struggle of the narrative is actually simply is, and I hope Lina will elaborate more on that, is the struggle we engage with with the, with the mainstream media. Because what is the stream media, uh, 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 mainstream media narrative uh, about Syria globally is that, again, uh, there is no political context. You hear about uh, a war, civil war, all the time there is a war between a sad regime, which is a kind of a secular regime, even if it's horrible, but still secular, and Islamist, you know? And you rarely actually come across in the uh, mainstream media coverage about Syria any good and deep and decent analysis about the political context. So again, we are, as a Syrians, deprived from our political agency. Yeah? Uh, there is no story. We don't have story there. It just, uh, there is obsession with IS, with radicals, with the terms about civil war. And this actually, uh, the mainstream media um, discourse or narrative is in a good alliance with uh, the narrative of the international community represented by its um, uh, uh, humanitarian agencies. So that the, the narrative of the UN agencies, because in this narrative, again, you hear terms like crisis, disasters, refugees, refugee crisis, migration crisis. So we became only this again, again and again, we are deprived from our political agency. So Syria became, whenever you came across uh, the name Syria or, or, or anything related to Syria, there is a refugee crisis. It's as, as if it's a tsunami in Syria, yeah? as if there was no grassroots movement, as if there was no, even before, even prior to 2011, as if there were no decades of uh, dissidency of people who really fought for freedom, social justice, dignity, that doesn't exist in the mainstream media and in the, of course, the narrative of mainstream media or the narrative of the UN or the humanitarian agencies. Again, it's all about crisis, refugee and, and migration. And again, as, as if it's an earthquake or tsunami. And, and last uh, front of the struggle over narrative, I think it is actually uh, the narrative that is uh, the, the uh, counter revolutionary forces in the region and here I'm referring actually to the other regimes in the region, whether they are the dict uh, military dictatorships in a country like Egypt, for example, now with the uh, General Sisi, or even in Algeria, or even the oligarchy regime, the corrupted oligarchy regime in Lebanon, or the corrupted authoritarian monarchies in Gulf, sta in Gulf states. All these regimes you know, that, that are uh, around Syria, or they were also helped by the first wave of the revolution uh, in the Arab Spring, the, their narrative, their official narrative about Syria has been consistent. It's a lesson to learn, but what kind of a lesson? It's a lesson to their populations that look at Syria, yeah? look at learn. If you ever dare to challenge a statu quo, if you ever dare to challenge your regimes, even though, even though that your regimes are corrupted, and we know that, and we are not doing anything about it, this is what will happen to you, you will be punished. So the narrative of the counter-revolution forces in the region, again, these regimes, is actually turning Syria, turning the story of Syrians to a lesson for the uh, populations in the region that do not ever dare to, uh, to try to think about any revolutionary actions. So, so briefly, this is for me the struggle over narrative and the, the three fronts that we've been engaged with. Now, I will just briefly mention the other struggle, which is the struggle to create a new narrative. As I said, because today is a different moment, 10 years after the, uh, the moment, the brilliant, the, the, the amazing you know, moment of 18 March of 2011, today in 18 March, 2021, it's entirely different moment. So what kind of new narrative we can also create? Because, because this is the challenge now. Okay, uh, I just mentioned briefly, uh, the, str the struggle uh, or the fronts we fight against narrative imposed of us, but then the question on us that, 
uh, on our, uh, it's, it's the burden on our, on our shoulder. What kind of new narrative that we have to come up with? And I think here also I will mention, uh, uh, briefly, sorry, mention three things. First and foremost is not actually to stuck in the rhetoric discourses or narrative of the early days of the revolution. So we have to be careful not to be nostalgic and not to repeat uh, the same old narrative of 2011, because unfortunately it is not the bright moment of 2011. So we need to, to be critical. We need to come uh, to, uh, to, to uh, again, to be critical and to speak about our failures and about shortcomings. And that will help, will help us, I hope, to create a new narrative that is building a bridge with the old slogans of the revolution, dignity, freedom, social justice, justice. but at the same time, it will help us not to stuck in these nostalgic uh, uh, discourses or narratives. The second thing is we have, I think, to combine the personal with the, polit with the political, and more importantly, we have to combine the local with the global, because I think it's now important for us Syrians to, to acknowledge that we need to put Syria where it really belongs. It's not just a local struggle by local agents. It is part of a global struggle. Uh, Syria is part of a global struggle to achieve democracy, justice, and, 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 and social justice worldwide. This is what our new narrative, I think, that we need to create should focus on. We should also build bridges with other revolutionary or with other oppressed groups fighting for other causes across the globe, whether it's in the Middle East, like in, with our brothers and sisters in, in Iraq or Lebanon or elsewhere, where they are also now fighting to topple their, to topple their corrupt regime, or even across the globe. We should really build stronger bridges, uh, bridges with, with fighting for other causes like gender equality, global warming. This is an important component, I think, for the new narrative for Syria today. The last thing I think, which is also important in creating what I, sh I think it's a must for a new narrative for us Syrians today, who still believe in democracy, is actually to allow mourning and grief to show vulnerability. This is important because also we rarely do that actually. We should allow mourning and grief in our narrative, but also at the same time, highlighting the importance of this, at the same time, it's extremely important in my opinion, not to fall into a narrative of victim, because that's very dangerous. Because once we um, uh, build our narrative, uh, uh, the, uh, our narrative about the notion of victimhood, I think we will unfortunately ended up uh, uh, creating a, a shell, like a kind of a safe bubble, that we are hiding it, and this will become our identity, the narrative of victimhood, and this will not lead to anything progressive or good. And we can see good examples from the history, whether it's Israel or Poland, uh, where, where when you actually uh, create the narrative of victimhood to be actually a, a main component of your identity for the future, it will lead to something not very progressive, progressive and not very democratic. I will end here, and sorry if I um, no, perfect, took more perfect. than my time, you know? And I'm happy to come back to elaborate on these points later. Thank you. I, I wanted to make sure that Lena get, got to respond, particularly to the first part of your, your comments here about the struggle over prevailing narratives. I'm, I'm curious, as somebody who's a, a very famous journalist, what you, what you have to say there. Thank you very much, Lisa. It's been a great honor to be here with you and with uh, Mohammed and uh, Alma. Uh, in fact, you know, 10 years on, Syria has been uh, on the top um, agenda of the news for, for many, many years, uh, to the credit of many journalists around the world and in the Arab world as well. Of course, uh, the, uh, the protests at the beginning were highly covered, but soon everything swift towards the armed conflict. And here uh, I want to highlight that this is not a civil war, but actually it's a war uh, organized by a government that is fortified by its army, supported by two uh, um, uh, players like Russia and Iran, uh, you know, killing its own, own people, bombing and using all sorts of artillery to push people towards uh, holding up arms. People resisted for at least two years to hold up arms, but after, uh, you know, uh, seeing their families, their villages, their towns being bombed, they, they had to uh, revert to arms. 
but 10 years on, we just need to have a look, an overview over how the conflict or how the Syria story has been portrayed in the media. First of all, in government controlled area, the regime has maintained a control over who comes in and sees what's happening on the ground, that no international journalists were able to come in. And when visas were allowed for international journalists to come in, they were only allowed to go to areas where the government wants them to see what they want them to, to see. Uh, they were have minders with them all the time. So they were controlling every single word that is coming out of government controlled areas. Nevertheless, they were incredible journalists who came in and managed to break through and say what they have to say on the ground. On the other side, many, uh, many journalists managed to, to come into, into inside Syria and cover uh, the situation. But it, it became so complex with so many players around the world, uh, it became a full-fledged war, and that was the main narrative that dominated the, uh, the, uh, the coverage uh, on Syria. ISIS came in, the brutality of ISIS, and the Islamophobia, that's what the regime really played on from day one, as Muhammad was saying, that this is not a, a revolution, but rather an extremist movement that is trying to, uh, to shake a, a secular regime that is protecting uh, all the, uh, the um, minorities inside Syria. Uh, a you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy that the regime has played on planned for and got all the support to uh, to uh, succeed in allow in enforcing or in enabling the whole world to fall into that trap and and cover uh, uh, the Syria story through the prism of Islamism, Islamophobia and uh, armed uh, conflict. Of course, there has been incredible coverage of the refugees, of their suffering, uh, of the displacement of uh, them arriving into the uh, the um, uh, the uh, European borders or being drawn in, in the sea. But what is important is, uh, is to maintain uh, the ownership of the Syrian narrative as the Syrian people wants it. Uh, today, there is a lot that of what we can see that, you know, it's focusing on the Islamic uh, fight against uh, the regime. Uh, the Russians played an important role and they still play an important role in uh, this information campaign against the original narrative of the revolution, of the protest, of the demand for change, for democracy, for freedom. Uh, and uh, they're trying to um, you know, um, uh, spread the word of uh, uh, attacks on all social media and on uh, their own media to play on the words to fit within the regime's narrative vis-a-vis -vis the, the narrative of um, this is Islam, Islamophobic, this is a terrorist uh, um, uh, situation, it's not uh, a call for change or a call for, uh, for democracy. Unfortunately, the mainstream media internationally uh, followed suit. Um, you know, we've seen what happened with the white helmet. Uh, they were like uh, um, volunteers that were trying to rescue people who were bombed heavily by both the Russians and uh, government uh, forces. Uh, we've seen an international campaign mainly led by the Russians to, um, to de defame them, to accuse them as being Al-Qaeda. And of course, whenever you raise the flag of Al-Qaeda or Islamist or Muslim Brotherhood, every, the whole world freaks out. Whenever you mention the, uh, the word of you know, Islamic or prayers or, or holding up arms connected to, uh, to um, you know, um, especially the Sunni community inside Syria, the whole world raises the, the flag and, 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 and is alarmed. Little attention has been paid to what other militias also using the Islamic uh, lines and Islamic slogans like Hezbollah and Iran inside Syria. Little attention was paid to their atrocities, to their um, you know, um, you know, crimes against humanity that they've conducted, con uh, conducted inside Syria. And I think 10 years on, uh, what we can do, especially after a Syria fatigue on all level, on the political level, uh, on the humanitarian level, on the financial level, and certainly 
on the media level. What we can do uh, uh, as Syrians is to keep trying uh, all the time to raise the voices, to use our voices, and the voices of not only the war voices, the voices of the civil society, of the artists, of the um, you know creative people, of the uh, professionals in Syria who have done a lot uh, for their own community and continue to do, and they are the ones that you can rely on for a future Syria one day uh, when when there is a chance for us to go back, or when there is real. Uh, democracy happening. And that also falls with what uh, Attar is saying about the new narrative that we can work on writing, work on describing, uh, and work on enforcing internationally and in the Arab world. There are lots of polarization that happened in the Arab world uh, when it comes to the coverage of Syria, but not only Syria, the whole you know, uh, um, uprisings in the Arab world, especially this conflict between you know, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, and, uh, and Qatar, uh, that played a lot on how the media portrayed the situation in, uh, in the Arab world. Uh, but at the same time, there are incredible uh, independent new media uh, outlets that are coming up, popping out, uh, out and trying to speak in, in a free way speak the narrative of the Arab people that they want to write about their, their causes and about their revolutions and about their uprising that doesn't fit within the official narrative that these regimes are trying to impose uh, publicly and try to um, uh, uh, enforce it as the only and the rightful narrative. And that's the only struggle that we have to continue with is to keep the voices up. Thank you, Lena. Alma, uh, last but not least on this, would you, would you like to say something in response both to Lena and Mohammed uh, about the, the first dimension, the struggle over prevailing narratives, and also take us a bit further on what is a remarkable part of your own work uh, to help us think through new possibilities, uh, new reimaginings. Yeah, good evening, uh, Lisa. And um, it's amazing to be with outstanding Syrians like Lina and Mohammed. Uh, it's an honor in itself uh, speaking to everyone. Uh, I would I would like to take maybe the conversation uh, to another level, or not another, a different uh, level, you know, um, which is uh, to take it from the arts perspective and arts point of view, just to diversify, you know, um, even our own narratives as speakers today. Mm, I do, I mean, I do believe that, um, of course, I mean, the story is very well, very well known that artists uh, took the lead in the revolution, you know, and since 2011 and even before. We, uh, I, I always like to start by uh, mentioning that the artistic movement and artistic narratives and struggle over narratives uh, through the arts started in Syria way before the revolution with the independent artistic scene, with the in independent uh, artists who were trying to find niches for for freedom of, of artistic expression and artistic expression more broadly. And we know that the revolution came as a moment where, you know, it was a beginning moment. It was, you know, as, as you know, I'll take a biblical reference, maybe the, you know, in the beginning there was the world, John 1, 1, but yeah, I mean, we have seen that, we, ha we have witnessed that, all the words that were said uh, in hidden rooms, uh, all the words that were said in hidden circles suddenly became, you know, loud voices on the street. And uh, we cannot deny that also right from the beginning, artists reclaim public spaces as, as you know, as spaces of, of expression uh, and including artistic expression. We, we know the famous uh, tennis balls uh, that were thrown from the mountains with a lot of words written on them, free Syria, etc. And also the fountains that were colored. So we cannot, I think, that separate here the narrative, um, the spoken narrative from the visual narrative, because overall, I mean, with our artistic expression, with all its tools, um, you know, was bringing together a whole new momentum, a whole new language, a whole new sociolinguistic experience for Syrians. Um, it 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 added, you know, I think that maybe us added a sensorial a sensorial aspect where you know the body, the mind, and the and the word came together and expressed by chanting by. Dancing, 
dancing, by drawing, and it continued. And maybe, maybe also art, art because of its vulnerable, um, uh, you know, nature. Because by by nature, it's a very vulnerable um, uh, medium. Also suffered a lot. And uh, I mean, when we when we look at uh, at all the discourse of the, of military discourse and so on, where do artists stand? How can they? I mean, fight or find a place or escape, uh, escape, uh, you know, a persecution uh, when when they voice up and when they try try to uh, present their own narrative, but also when they represent their own communities' voices uh, through the arts and through artistic expression. And I think that was the main challenge: how can they escape these this violence, and how can the artistic space become a refuge for artists? Uh, while being while being political at the same time, it's not about escaping uh, their their responsibility. I do believe that Syrian artists and artistic community and intellectuals of Syria and all this community took the lead uh, in in you know in chanting for freedom, but at the same time in taking own responsibility in 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 putting together um, a new narrative on the table, uh, and even at, at the hardcore of aesthetics itself, you know Syria Syria when through uh, an imposed uh, aesthetic, uh, you know, for 50 years, the, the bath aesthetic, we have seen this, you know, it's people are not allowed to to, 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 to speak differently. We, we should all look the same. It's hegemony, you know? So I, I, at that time, since the beginning of the Syrian revolution till today, I feel that maybe artists have, have that privileged or maybe not privileged, but very specific case because when, when Muhammad, for example, he spoke that we need to to develop and and have a new narrative and and you know and continue it should change i feel maybe artists had the privilege to stay in their own place and con and develop their own ways and and or expressions on uh, on individual narratives to start with because this is how artists do it it's always about the personal story and at the same time in how artists coming together in in, in artistic spaces can share this narrative and can pre present uh, present uh, in a common way and and bring together a new story um, uh, to 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 I mean to the world, um, you know um, Jean Luc Godard he spoke he said something that I always love so much he said every story has a beginning a middle and and an end but not necessarily in that order and uh, you know and I feel that this where arts adds value um, it's it not necessarily. Uh, uh, it, sometimes it is accused of creating a cacophony when it comes to 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 the narrative because of its creative uh, nature because it's it's not uh, it's not bringing always clarity because artists uh, arts uh, you know is about questioning and not uh, about positioning necessarily the way media is for example so because of that uh, questioning and experimentation aspect that Syrian artists showed us in the past past 10 years. They've been accused of being dreamers, of living in their tower of ivory tower. We have uh, listened to all those accusations while at, at the same time they've been leaders in deconstructing, deconstructing the homogenic narrative imposed in, in their creative mediums. And I think that this is where Syrian artist, uh, we can even claim an avant-garde movement in that sense, because, you know, as Hal Foster uh, uh, claims that, um, you know, we can speak about an avant-garde movement when there's critique of bourgeoisie. Well, uh, Syrian artists, they have criticized not only bourgeoisie, but they have, you know, criticized and deconstructed and analyzed uh, all aspects of, of, of society, of ideas, of ideologies. And I feel that they contributed a lot to breaking dogmas and, and even to opening taboos. And that's the main thing. I think that the main role of Syrian artists in, um, in driving a new narrative is by breaking the, the taboos and unleashing, unleashing those, uh, those um, you know, I, ideals and also values that uh, that will take us into that new narrative we all dream that to arrive 
to a place where it will influence and impact and move masses. So I, I believe that, uh, you know, um, a lot has happened uh, and uh, it, we, a lot of mapping happened too and a lot of books and theories and researchers uh, mapped over the past 10 years uh, in terms of creative expression in Syria. But um, I believe that we never know when this narrative, our common narrative will go viral. We never know, you know? So we have to keep the faith. Uh, the moment is not there yet, but I do believe that everything that happened uh, um, uh, has set a, a very solid stone for the future already. Uh, a, a revolution has failed, has failed military, but also me being, being coming from the art world, I'm a pacifist and in any, in any case, I've never believed in a military solution. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't take a position from people who um, uh, defended themselves using using their own weapons. But I was always against militarization of the of Syria. Against uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I've always uh, uh, you know took took the position that this is a Syria the Syria story. This is not a um, you know a place for all uh, armies of the world to 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 come and, and and you know take the lead on our story. This is our story. We have to write write our own story and and uh, you know take agency of it and when it comes to to the political place i uh, i just want to say maybe one last thing that um yes we need to always keep an, uh, the art the art space as a safe space for for people for artists and their audiences uh, to uh, to be able to to come together and uh, to to uh, negotiate and re renegotiate that narrative because I feel that this is a, a, a unique safe space. It's a shelter of ideas uh, that, uh, you know, um, art forms, they not only um, stimulate uh, feelings and stimulate innovative thinking, but also uh, it, it, it's a space to, for, to open a, a conver always a difficult conversation. That's only possible in the art space uh, sometimes. Um, and uh, uh, finally, I think that in, in the Syria case, uh, all our art spaces were, uh, were um, civic spaces. They became the agoras, uh, uh, you know, where artists meet and, and where artists renegotiate re re a social contract. And, and, um, and that it was that valuable since day one and it continued to be. And uh, maybe it had that privilege to stay away, uh, a bit away from the, especially from the conflict because uh, artists, they have their own ways uh, that, are, um, that are only known for them usually. And uh, this uh, kept them maybe uh, protected, but at the same time, give them a lot of freedom to continue to create and to take part in building that future narrative. And we should always bring them on the table uh, to, where, to, to bring all the results. And, uh, and they're not very good in, in also sharing their, their uh, experience and their knowledge. So we always need to bring that out uh, from, from artists. Thank you, Alma. That was a very provocative response. And I wonder if uh, Mohammed or Lina, you wanted to respond to part of what Alma was saying as well, in particular, that art is a, 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 a specific way or a distinct way to have difficult conversations. And I was wondering sort of what do you see as some of those difficult conversations? Mohammed, you had spent a, a bit of the earlier part of the talk um, suggesting some of the kinds of uh, difficult conversations that that Syrians uh, might want to have. And I wonder what might be some of the differences between the genres of journalism and the genres specific to the various art forms you each work in. So i.e. in terms of modes of expression or Alma was talking about uptake, the influence uh, certain kinds of genres of artistic expression have. How do they differ from journalistic forms of expression? And what kinds of um, art or journalism uh, have the capacity to stabilize or entrench certain kinds of discourses to fix them, if you will, uh, more readily than others? 
Uh, okay, Lisa. Um, I've, I mean, this is many things to cover. So, and I, I need. I think we need to be careful about time. So, I will try also to be brief. And please interrupt me. Please feel free to interrupt me, uh, because we can speak forever about this. Uh, because I also very personally, it's something. It's uh, for me. It's ongoing discussion and ongoing debate. I can speak more about about theater, and uh, this is my tool. And I think. I mean, um, uh, I, to start with, I think it's up to each artist or each, each um, uh, like to 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 to, uh, to decide the kind of form. But what I I, I I can maybe dare to generalize that I think what was interesting, uh, if you are tracing uh, uh, artists uh, respond or the way they actually. Um, uh, reflected on the ongoing events in Syria through art is that the question of form actually became very well connected to the to the to the um, to the events and and the, to the different phases of struggle. Yeah. So uh, because I think to an extent before uh, in the time of in the more normal times. Yeah. I don't know what normal times mean, but let's say in normal time, I think the question of form usually. Uh, could come first, the, uh, and and you, you could be very busy actually in experimenting forms. While I think in my case, and I speak about fellow artists who are, I was watching and I was lucky to see the work and that, how the work de developed, I think the form uh, was a response actually. So it became um, uh, a way to respond, an, an urgent way to respond to to. Uh, specific moment in this struggle, because in this past 10 years, uh, we moved into phases, you know, um, and I will not elaborate more because that's a long story, but that's the story of Syria in the past 10 years. So each phase, like you were inside the country, you know, there was a peaceful uh, movement against uh, uh, a brutal regime. And then uh, the movement started to get militarized. And then you are exiled to the neighboring countries because this is more or less, the same journey of most of, of, of Syrians exiled, you know, and uh, that, you know, you, you were first were forced to uh, leave Syria to a neighboring country, whether it's Turkey, whether it's Lebanon, whether it's Jordan, Egypt. And then from there, after a few years, also you were pushed away and then you reach Europe. So in, in each phase, like whether you are inside Syria, neighboring country, and then more uh, far away, I think, the question of form and how and how do we find the, the right form actually to reflect so it's really it's a personal but at the same time there was general thing like that I, I was witnessing how this question of form and what kind of tools at this moment we can we could use to 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 enable us to reflect uh, the other thing which i think it's important and i i actually value and i think it's something positive because also we need to draw some positive things from from this is that I, I appreciate that the uh, question of art productivity among Syrian artists is also a, a, a question of urgency. It's not a question of, um, uh, I would say, um, luxurious acts. It is a question of urgency, and that's and, and I like this. I think this is important. I think I think um, this makes the work more authentic, and this makes makes the work more important first and foremost for you as an artist. Okay? So uh, I, I, I would say that that the work for us uh, became, uh, why it became urgent? Because it became our own way actually to deal with the unbearable, yeah? To deal with the unimaginable because actually the situation in Syria and our situations are both unbearable and unimaginable. Uh, actually, the last play I wrote, and I don't want to really to speak in details about my work, but the last play, it was um, something about the future. And many art critics or even people who I work with, the actors, yeah, the, they were actors from Poland. They say it's a dystopia. And I stayed silent because for me, it's a reality. I mean, I, I, but, but I didn't want to project my reality on Polish actors, but what they saw a dystopia for me was a reality of Syria. What they saw something unimaginable or something like unbelievable for me was what we live, what we witness, you know? So also this is a, again, a, a kind of sometimes tough negotiations that an artist as a Syrian artist have to deal with, with people who are your collaborators and you want again to build bridges with others. Yeah, you don't want to stay in your bubble, but sometimes your reality, it's very hard to adjust or very hard to believe by the others. But at the same time, you need to find the common ground. And again, what I mentioned briefly in, in my first maybe response, 
I do think today it's more and more important for us Syrian artists to uh, 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 work on Syria as part of something more global, as it is actually again and again, because as you know, uh, Lisa, uh, uh, Syria is a, a battleground, it's a proxy world. So the whole world is in Syria, apparently. Literally, you have armies from many countries and you have uh, militias from many countries and you have interventions from many countries. At the same time, Syrians are across the globe. Now. It's uh, like, you know, exiled and displaced. So uh, we are all over the world. The, the world intervened in us uh, is all over Syria. So, and, and naturally Syria, how it should be manifested in our artistic world, it should be part of something global. So this is part of the ongoing negotiation among Syrian artists and among Syrian, uh, and between Syrian artists and their uh, non-Syrian collaborators. The other thing, uh, and I will, I, will, I will end here because uh, again, we need to be careful about the time, is actually, actually the ongoing tough negotiation with the market also, because unfortunately, back to the question of narrative, Unfortunately, it's not always, uh, you know, uh, even when you are, how to say, uh, hosted by, uh, by uh, uh, warmly hosted by a, a new community, but then you have the agendas of the cultural market. Yeah? Then you have uh, labels and titles are imposed on you, either violently or most of the time is gently, sometimes it with good intention. So you become, as a Syrian artist, you become the artist in exile only, or you become the artist coming from the war zone. And your topics should be always associated with the expectation of this market, the expectation of the producers, of the donors, of the production networks, of the curators. And this is again, a challenge for the narrative that we are trying to, to, to create, uh, the narrative of hope, the realistic narrative of hope, not, not narrative, uh, narrative of pollution, a narrative of hope that is at the same time realistic, because again, uh, as as much as these things are are part of who we are today, because we are refugees, yeah, we are artists in exile, uh, we are artists coming from war zone. Yes, we are that, but we are not only that, yeah. And this is very important. We are much more than that, and that sometimes it's a very challenging negotiation with uh, with the new uh, uh, artistic production. Uh, agencies that you are you have to work with because this is now and because they most of the time act based on trends uh, on on markets needs because also culture and art on art has markets we know that we, we shouldn't deny that so this is another ongoing negotiation and another tough battle over narratives too if I may join uh, here, uh, Lisa, and uh, just reflect a little bit about what uh, Alma was talking and uh, uh, and Muhammad, uh, I think it's very important also to think about the audience. Who is the audience that we are targeting? Uh, and uh, when it, if you want to compare the role of journalists versus the role of uh, the artists, as if you're talking about the instant impact versus the ongoing or in-depth uh, uh, impact, uh, the the mass audience, uh, not the elitist one would want to hear or we want to watch we want to read the quick important like immediate uh, reporting but i have to say and here you know chapeau for many uh, syrian filmmakers uh, and this genre uh, during the war, because even the unexperienced, uh, the uh, you know citizen journalists, they've managed to uh, create a, a new form, uh, not a new form, or enter this uh, this uh, genre of filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, and many of them managed to travel with their films, with their narrative of the revolution uh, uh, around the world. Uh, of course, the role of the artist on the, on the other hand, and you, you can uh, comment on that, Alma and, and Muhammad, is more to reflect on also, uh, give a more in-depth and artistic view of, uh, of, the, uh, of the situation. And the audience here is, is different. Although, you know, for example, an Attar's play is, plays are, you know, very good examples when he used also, um, you know, um, 
refugees, uh, refugee women to, to be on the stage, uh, or even the professional Syrian actors and actresses with him in, you know, uh, uh, while I was waiting, for example, one of the plays, he really depicted the situation inside Syria in a very artistic form, but you watch the, the, the play as if you're actually reading a chapter of what's happened on reality. So I think now, you know, 10 years on, it's very important to um, allow uh, the Syrian artists, the creatives, the filmmakers, the writers uh, to uh, reflect more on the now, the back, and the future uh, in their own uh, creative tools, because that's what would last. As I, I go back to the point I mentioned earlier, that there is a Syria fatigue, even among the audience, whenever they switch on TV to watch something and something comes up on Syria, they'll remember the war, the bombing, the Islamophobia. So it's good to introduce something new, it's to introduce something different. And that's why I focused in the report you mentioned earlier in the introduction to talk about the women, the civic, the artists uh, uh, in the um, uh, in this uh, uh, reportage about their own struggle, but also their hope, their resilience, and their continuation with their own revolution, whether inside or outside Syria. And I think personally, I would really, um, you know, um, you know, uh, shed a lot of um, uh, hope on uh, the Syrian artists because their role uh, is very important in different genres that they're working on. Thank you very much. And Alma, I, I want you to be able to chime in here. I think it's a very important place. Yes. Thank you so much for highlighting uh, all those um, issues, Lena. Especially, I think that, and you in your work also, you uh, you highlighted women's role, and uh, you've done amazing feminist films. And I think that this, all this, you know, uh, helped and and helps in in deconstructing uh, powers and 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 the way the narratives are put in a patriarchal uh, way, you know. And I think that all starts from that patriarchal system that was challenged with the revolution. That's the main challenge uh, into a more fair, more democratic space. And, and I think that you, uh, both of you as artists, you, you contributed a lot into showing a model and a way of how this is done. Um, I think that, I mean, to, uh, I think that the main challenge that now we, we uh, picking up on Lena's point on audiences and maybe enlarging it a bit to include identities. I think that we will have a new generation of Syrians who are born outside Syria. And, uh, you know, and we, we do have that polarization existing between those who are inside Syria and those who are outside. And I believe that the, the, the we, if we need to focus on an, on creating a new narrative, we need to embrace that. We need to embrace that polarization, and we need to open that speciality uh, and not space, not speciality, spatiality, because you know we uh, Syrians outside Syria we lost the geography, but we do not want to lose the history. And I think that this is our key focus in the future. How can we make sure that we will have a history we agree on, that we have a narrative that will will not be uh, you know, that will embrace the struggle, but that struggle is channeled in a peaceful medium and not, I mean, I think we need to move from from daunting the struggle, the way we, we, we used to, you know, we used to speak about before, or, or the way, um, you know, dictatorship uh, uh, wanted us to be like, no one wanted us to have a struggle, but struggle is the, you know, it's nature, it's it's part of survival, it's uh, the, the, the rule of life. Uh, so how can we move into a space where narrative is negotiated, where struggle is embraced and channeled in peaceful medium instead of being, you know, uh, oppressed? And I think that's the key challenge uh, between inside, outside Syria, between people of different opinions, people of, I mean, between many narratives. How can we achieve a harmony without uh, unifying again and without, uh, you know, setting an, another and new patriarchal, uh, uh, you know, pressure on our story and on, on our history? So this is where issues of diversity come and, and highlight it as a priority. How can we embrace uh, different ethnicities? Uh, and here we speak more, uh, you know, in in terms of culture, I mean, and not only us, but this is the broader uh, definition of culture. How can we 
uh, in our narrative, how can our narrative embrace the different languages, ethnicities, religions, beliefs, uh, you know, uh, of our people? And, and how can all be represented in a narrative that is not uh, uh, homogenic, but is open and diverse and free at the same time and everlasting moving? Because, you know, we know that democracy, it, it's not a goal. Democracy is a live workshop. We will never achieve democracy. We might achieve it today and lose it the next day. And here I go back to Godard and uh, that you know definition of, of history because we tend to see it in a stiff way. We tend to create stiff spaces and stiff narratives. And, and I believe that if the revolution taught us something, something, it taught us that we are fluid. We as people, as Syrian, are fluid. We, we adapt easily, we create. We are creatives by nature. We are craft makers. We have a civilization of 12,000 years. And this is not a joke. This is something that we used to, you know, speak about as, a, as, as nostalgia. But today we have, to, we have to turn it into tools and way to be able to, uh, you know, still uh, appreciate and recognize the actual geographical Syria and people who lives on that land and be, be always part of it with Without, you know, breaking with our own, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, culture and own identities. Um, so I think that uh, when when it's it's mainly that uh, that big challenge, and it's mainly coming for the generations who will follow because we are the generation who witness and we are the generation who will not be able to analyze uh, because. I cannot claim that I understand what happened. I do not want to understand because I, I don't have time. I'm still living. I'm st I still have my daily worries about the Syrian revolution. I'm still engaged. I have my, my daily work, but I would leave it to generations to come to tell our story, to get inspired by our story and maybe make it happen and maybe succeed in what we failed in doing so far. Uh, but um, so now I think that our role is to at least archive, archive uh, the story in a way that is decent and that is respectful and that will, will you know, when, uh, when the next generation will read it, they will, they will not uh, be disappointed with us the way we were disappointed with our parents' generations and with how they failed us in, in, in the country they brought us. Uh, that will, you know, and I think that a, a lot of price has been paid and uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't allow uh, this to ever happen again in our history. And the narrative is the way we will protect uh, what we will protect uh, that blood, you know. Uh, and the price of that blood is that it's a huge responsibility. And it's so sad that even some people, they always call for action versus like, let's stop talking, let's stop speaking, show us some action. We need to start by appreciating the word and we need to start by appreciating the narrative itself as, a, as an action, you know, narrative is an action uh, in itself. Thank you, Alma, that was very powerful. I wanna make sure that we have some time to open it up to our patient audience now. And Sophia Fenner has been kind enough to volunteer to um, sift through the questions and, and offer some to you for a response. We've received some wonderful questions and I wanna just remind people that you can write a question via the Q&A feature or leave it um, as a comment if you're watching live on Facebook. We obviously won't be able to get to everything, but I wanted to start with a question from uh, one of our audience members, Gamal Mansour, uh, who asks a question to Alma, do we need to create counter symbols? Are they really necessary? And if so, how can we do that when pro-revolution Syrians today are having clashes over symbols like the flag? And while this is directed to Amma, I think it would be wonderful to have the whole panel respond a little bit to um, perhaps the question of how coherence and discord can exist in this new narrative making process in this struggle um, because everyone has mentioned you know uh, Syrian voices but of course the reality is that Syrian voices are diverse and are not always going to agree with one another so what is the role of 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 consensus what is the role of discord as it relates to to building new narratives but Anna would you like to start 
Yeah, I'll be very short. Thank you, Jamal, for asking. It's an interesting question. Uh, uh, I'm going to be short and precise. I believe that if we um, start from freedom of expression point of view, uh, then we this uh, I mean we would accept all the symbols that will be created. We cannot anyway in any way uh, oppress any uh, uh, conversation or any created uh, symbols and patterns and, and ideas. But I also believe that the way it works in the arts and in media and everything is by filtering. So uh, time will will tell us. Uh, what stays and what just uh, you know fall so the the quality the value will stay by itself and i do believe in time um i will uh, i will uh, jump in on to, uh, on the comment uh, you know as uh, i think it's very important that we keep on uh, the narrative and as you uh, rightly said uh, alma uh, things will filter but it's important to have uh, all the voices heard all the voices uh, commenting on what's happening and writing and documenting uh, i live in lebanon and after uh, their civil war today their school uh, and their generation of of lebanese they don't have history books in their schools because they couldn't agree on writing their own history. They couldn't agree on which perspective to write uh, their, uh, the, the, the history of their, their civil war. Uh, but many, but all the Lebanese, they know what happened. Uh, there are uh, incredible films, incredible books, incredible novels that were uh, written about uh, about the civil war. Uh, it depends, everyone will take the, the, the narrative that they want, but it's important to keep uh, writing, keep the voices uh, uh, out and keep documenting in different uh, forms of art. And I think things will be, will be filtered as, as Alma said. And I will just add one thing, like uh, I do believe in oral history, uh, a language like the Aramaic, for example, it's not written, it's spoken. And, and I believe that the story will never die. It will continue for thousands of years, even if it's not written. So uh, I, I don't have, I don't have any fears over our uh, narrative of the revolution, Syrian revolution. Uh, I will just add briefly because I think it's an important point because we've been speaking, or maybe I personally, maybe more emphasize on uh, uh, one narrative or future narrative or what kind of narrative can we create today. I didn't mean, but like at all that it's it's something. It's about. Uh, uh, I mean, we actually, the whole revolution or the whole movement was against authoritarian, uh, uh, against something that imposed on all of us. Actually, the revolution, but important part of it, that it gave each Syrian a unique voice. And that's something we want to keep, actually. We want to keep differences and we want to keep these unique voices. But for example, when I say that, let's try to invent a new, a new narrative that is combining hope with agony, not ignoring agony and, and uh, vulnerability, but with hope. All that let's try our best not to fall into a narrative of victim. Uh, yes, I I have this dream that we came all together to, to a general outline, let me put it like this, but just slightly beyond, directly beyond that, I'm very happy with differences. I'm very happy with, with different ways of reflections and different way of writing uh, things and different ways of, 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 of narrating our stories. But my, my, I mean, my hope is just to have these kind of, of things that bring us together, but they are very like very general things that I, I believe that would help us to come up, to come up with new meaningful uh, narrative, but it doesn't, it will not turn on, uh, us again to, uh, uh, kind of solid group where there's no unique voices. That's against what we all seek for. So these things, what, when I when I say again that let's try, we need to try our best uh, to build bridges with 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 with, with the struggles across the globe, with 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 uh, with, uh, with struggle against patriarchy, uh, with struggle for gender equality, with struggle even for, with the global against global warming. This is. Some, but, but that's our general outlines, not to fall into a trap of victimhood. These are general outlines, but just, just directly after that, I'm more than happy to, to, de to dis disagree immediately about other things or, or how do we do these things, you know? But I hope that, I, I think it's kind of necessary to come across some general outlines uh, when, we, when it comes to creating this uh, new narrative. But, but again, besides that, I, I'm really into uh, into having a lot of arguments and disagreements. Thank you. Thank you for speaking to that question. Um, to continue this discussion, perhaps of difference, but in a slightly more concrete register, um, we've gotten a couple of questions about 
uh, just the differing experiences of Syrians in exile. Um, so the differences between folks who are living perhaps in a more comfortable way and folks who are living in a, in a less comfortable, if, if, if that's even how to talk about it, way. So Katie Montoya asks, um, how do the panelists understand what it means to work for on behalf of Syria today? Um, how do Syrian artists remain accountable, and that may be language you want or don't want, um, to the most vulnerable in Syria, those with no legal status in refugee camps in Lebanon and Turkey, et cetera? So how, I think everyone could speak to this, how does the global Syrian community, as you put it, Mohammed, um, reconcile or work through or take advantage of or do something about these distinct differences in different people's experiences. Uh, okay, I, I will start. Uh, okay, I don't know. It's, um, uh, yeah, that, that's a brilliant point. I, I mean, uh, today there is no one Syria and there is no one Syria. So, uh, of course, I mean, uh, inside Syria geographically, you have different Syrias. There is Syria under the control of regime and its backers. And even in this Syria, you have areas where the Iranians have upper hand uh, uh, or, or militias backed by Russia have upper hand and so on. And you have areas where controlled uh, or, or you have the uh, Turkish influence or even militias or mercenaries fight under Turkish flag or support by Turkey. And you have also areas where you have Kurdish for forces protected by uh, uh, United States and its agenda. So like we have many series and even in, in the exile, we have Syrians who live in unbearable conditions in Lebanon, uh, in, in horrible conditions in the uh, in camps in Lebanon or Turkey, or even in, in North Syria and Idlib province. And, and, and of course you have Syrians in Europe, Syrians in North America, Syrians in Australia. So yeah, it's hard to, to, to uh, yeah, of course. I mean, and you have to be realistic about each context. You know? I would say that uh, I cannot speak on behalf of others, uh, honestly, but from a personal experience, yeah, this is what I can say that. I, I always try to approach uh, my work based on the context I'm in and uh, always um, tried not to be an outsider when I, when I work with my fellow series, because this is a trap also we can work, uh, we can fall into. Like, it doesn't enough that we, we hold the same nationality to be equal, huh? we know that. I'm a man and I work with women. And I know the advantages that come with me being a man in a conservative community, for example, or in a society. I need to be aware of that. I need to question that in my work all the time because I work with only with women only group. And that was a big challenge and a big question that I need every day to ask myself, to ask myself that do I willingly or not willingly, you know, using my advantages as a man from middle class working with women uh, from poorer class, for example. Uh, and so on and so on. So it's, it's, it's a matter of ongoing negotiation. Do we succeed all the time? Are we successful all the time? I don't know. This is up to the participants, the people who we work with to, to tell and also the audience sometimes to tell. But I think what I can tell from my personal experience is when I was inside of Syria, I approached my work uh, differently to when I, I was exiled in Lebanon because I lived in Lebanon for more fun than five years and I was also without I was uh, paperless stateless in Lebanon so I felt actually very strong when I was entering the space working with refugees because we were equal on that side between but we were again not equal on other sides but but I felt the strength that okay I'm not coming here uh, carrying any kind of uh, privileges when it comes to my papers or my legal status because I'm like you so that that uh, of course helped me but Again, I had to ask myself a question about being a male from middle class, for example. So when I moved to Germany, also my work, I, I, I approached my work in, uh, in a different way because now I'm, I have different legal status and because I'm living in a different context. So I think it's based on the context and based on ongoing negotiation that you need to question your new position. You need to question this on a daily basis, actually, especially, especially uh, back to Cathy's uh, uh, question, when you work with non-professionals, when you work with uh, refugees, when you work with people who still live in a very uh, complicated uh, situation. If I may um, add to Batar's uh, points, actually, uh, it, it's hard for any Syrian to represent every Syrian. Uh, to re represent every Syria. There, as Yaqtar said, there are many Syrians, but also we don't have the authority to speak on behalf of everyone. What we do is we voice 
some opinion, we voice some cases, we voice, we reflect on a situation. And of course, you know, being a journalist or being a playwright or being a filmmaker, uh, we are more privileged than, than, than the refugees in the refugee camp. Although uh, many of the artists who are living here in Lebanon, where I am now, they're deprived of any rights. Maybe they're not living in, in a refugee camp, but they don't have papers, they don't have documents, they don't have uh, the right to work, they don't have the right to travel, they are in a very uh, vulnerable situation. But I think every professional in his own profession will choose to focus on what he can do to deliver, to uh, to, to send the voice. And I think uh, the, the more you focus on, uh, you know, the, when you zoom in into one story, you can give a, a better picture on the uh, uh, on the general story, and um, you know, we try to be honest in what we uh, we pre present, we in what we reflect uh, through the different uh, genre, through the playwrights, or the, through the uh, the documentaries, or even through the painting. But that's just focusing on one side of the story that can tell the the uh, the whole. It's not. Uh, taking the voice of everyone or representing everyone. No one is able to rep represent everyone, even politicians. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the diversity and the change and the differences in the opinion is very important to be reflected as well. Um, you know, and, and what we do is, is only channel this, uh, not, uh, you know, uh, represent it and, and take, take its, its chance of, of voicing itself. Yeah, I will, I will add by challenging the question itself that suggests uh, that the artists uh, have a distance from the subject or that artists have a representational role. Uh, I don't know, I, I do believe in arts for our sake at the first, uh, you know, uh, first uh, st step of, of, of the artistic uh, production. And also, um, and also a very, very important, I think, point here is that um, an artist, uh, I mean, who is Syrian, um, uh, carries his own story, uh, you know, has all Syria inside him to start with, and he doesn't need to have legitimacy or validation to be able to express themselves. And, uh, but at the same time, I mean, to be fair also to all the artists, I believe we, we notice and we observe that all the artists uh, uh, try to be field also workers. Everyone goes to field, no one, um, everyone is very cautious when it comes to their, their art, artistic production is more derived from theories rather from reality. So everyone's, uh, everyone's artwork um, are very cautious to be relevant. And I think that the, the issue of relevance here is, is very, is key. And we have seen it and we have witnessed this in, in the majority of, of the Syrian artworks in the past 10 years. But also, I mean, we need to we need to also highlight that the future will not be the same because the artists, they are more now part of their countries of refuge and uh, they have the new identities and they have they need to we need to open the narrative and we need to open our artistic space to to be to be in intersectionality with other uh, people's stories and histories and even revolutions. I remember uh, lately I was in DC and I visited the African -American American uh, Museum, and there I saw a banner that says, "I'm I'm I'm an, I'm not an animal. I'm a man. I'm not an animal." And that was one of the first banners in the Syrian Revolution. An insan mani haywan. So it's exactly the same as the American Revolution. And there's it's very important for us to open up for intersectionality and and to find you know those. Um, and those, uh, I would say, references, artistic references and historical references. And that's something that I believe that Syrian artists will start to do very much in the future. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight, and maybe that's the last thing, which is the, the, uh, the very, uh, uh, the very, uh, alarming sometimes cultural policies in some countries versus other because the question started why some artists are are more comfortable than others because some countries like Germany they have cultural integration you know as, as a policy while others like Canada or or even the UK they they uh, you know they they have a, a cultural uh, cultural diversity strategy and and all those um, I don't want to get into the theories of these two but maybe you can google it google it and and, and 
see the difference. Uh, this is where, where, I mean, we expect artists to come with their own cultures uh, and, and, and by respecting its diversity, including languages and, and food and others, you know, other references, while others we expect, uh, uh, we expect people and refugees to come and wipe their culture and get in integrated in a new culture. And, and all this will either make it or break it for the narrative, for the Syrian narrative. Briefly, in the time that we have, I'm going to ask one more question um, and then hand it back to Lisa. Um, we've received a couple of questions about sort of what went wrong. Um, and I think there's a natural tendency on these kinds of anniversaries to reflect on the past and think about um, how to sort of diagnose what went wrong. And, and picking up on something that Alma said, I'm wondering how each of you sees the role of diagnosis in moving forward. Is that in fact a central piece of building a new narrative? Or is it something that perhaps, as I think Alma has suggested, it, it is simply too early. We cannot do it and, and the, sorry, I shouldn't say we, but um, that it is too early for that. And perhaps the role should be more about collecting or curating or archiving or, um, or other kinds of um, artistic production that do not depend on diagnosis. Uh, and I wonder if each of you could speak to that just briefly. Sorry, I don't know why I'm always starting, but I'll start anyway. So I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, this, this needs a new panel. I mean, this is, um, yeah, this is really, um, because it's very important. I'm not trying to underestimate the question at all. So. Uh, just to be very clear, but really it's uh, because it's hard to be brief about. But yeah, but I said very briefly in my first introduction that one of the most important things for me personally, like in creating this new narrative, is how to uh, create continuity with the early slogans of the revolution, but at the same time, not to stuck in this uh, rhetoric uh, narrative or this nostalgic narrative about, you know, uh, uh, because we live in a different uh, condition, entirely different condition. So, yeah. And when I say that, I, I remember, if I'm not mistaken, I even precisely say that we need to acknowledge our shortcomings and failures and point to them. And, and they will be embodied in anything in the process of writing, archiving, and, and creating something. That's don't, no doubt about that. You cannot just ignore. You cannot say, you cannot just uh, avoid that and discussion and keep going. Absolutely not. But to, to tell now, I think it's, it's, it's a lot, but I would just briefly say that, uh, 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 yes, I mean, uh, when it, it's, as, as Alma said, but I do not agree completely, we are still in the, in the moment. So it's not totally, we don't have the, um, the much needed sometimes critical distance that it comes with time to be, to have this more cold, and I'm not using the word cold here as a, a negative way, but, but this much cold, uh, much needed cold analysis to be very uh, accurate about uh, diagnosing the problems. We, we, because we can, because I have a family in Damascus, most of my family, I have friends. I have friends who are still disappeared, detained. Uh, we don't know nothing about them. I have friends who are, who, who are dying every day, you know, just just from from depression. Forget about illnesses. This is heavy. I'm personally, you know, every day I question why I have to wake up. Every day, I'm on the brink of depression, like all my fellow citizens. We are dancing with depression. It's a very dangerous dance, but we do. We dance. It's depression is my dance partner, who I'm trying not to fall in love with. To like uh, trying to have sessions and then leave leave my partner and see him another day. This is this is our daily reality. So I'm not saying that to forgive ourselves or to bother ourselves from having uh, harsh criticism, but I'm just saying to be realistic about the kind of this much needed, again, cold analysis about our shortcoming and fallings. Uh, but we, of course, there were mistakes, where there were things that we could have done differently. But overall, overall, uh, the brutality uh, that this movement was faced with, and 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 the the the, 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 the I mean the fast track that the the, the, the war moved from uh, uh, just a regime uh, cracking down and then you have an armed opposition to a proxy war. I mean, it was beyond our imagination. It was beyond. Even though if we could have, uh, we should have been aware. Of course, we should uh, be more aware to some geopolitical facts. Nevertheless, it was 
really uh, beyond even our wilder imagination. Unless, again, and that's why it, it, the narrative is important. When we put things in context, we need to remember that Syria, we were not citizens in Syria prior to the revolution. We were ruled by this authoritarian dynasty for 50 years, five zero, it's half a century. So we were just objects, we were silent objects. So we didn't have the luxury to practice politics. We didn't have even unions. This is what sometimes I struggle to, to tell my friends or colleagues from across the world. Forget about parties, forget about organized parties and elections. We didn't have unions, we didn't have, so, so that's why actually, some, yeah, it, again, it doesn't take mistakes from us, but you need to understand also that when you put things into that context that uh, uh, our shortcomings uh, at certain points in the revolution, in misreadings, uh, how the events will unfold and the geopolitical situations and uh, foreign interventions and the potential of foreign intervention, also, it's related because we didn't have any um, political life prior to the revolution. The revolution came to gain a political life, to gain a political participation. So we were deprived from practicing politics, from, from uh, having any agoras of discussions. And out of sudden, we tried to create that in 2011. We tried and we were uh, smashed brutally, brutally. So we couldn't, we couldn't even create these much needed spaces sometimes to have this dialogue that could actually, could save us from many mistakes that we did. And I'm insisting in that we did. So yeah, so I'm, we are acknowledging that. But putting things into context, I think uh, we, 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 uh, uh, we it's, it's very hard today, I mean, to have this cold nerve of, of, uh, of having a, a comprehensive analysis uh, about how we could things, uh, did, did things uh, uh, differently. Saying that again, I'm repeating, sorry to repeat myself, it's important to acknowledge the, acknowledge the shortcomings and failures, but hopefully we can do another panel, Lisa, about that, because honestly, the time now is too short for to elaborate more, yeah? I agree, we definitely will do another panel, but I wanna let Lena and Alma also have a last word and then we'll conclude, but I, I do think that this merits a, a separate conversation. Uh, I will be very brief, uh, Lisa. I just want to uh, um, add, add a few points where I a little bit disagree with Attar. Uh, I think it's very important to be uh, to have self-criticism, and unfortunately, still many Syrians they don't have this uh, culture of self-criticism. Certainly, when we're talking about the uh, the majority of the opposition, I wouldn't say all the opposition, uh, but I think uh, you know the brutality that the Syrians were faced with, no matter what plan. And B they have uh, had in mind or thought of, uh, you know, it, it was too much. They, they, there was no chance for us to succeed. It was a decision not only by the regime. I go back to comments Attar uh, uh, made at the beginning. It was even regional that no one had any interest in this peaceful civic movement with all its creative and, um, you know, uh, incredibly uh, influential uh, tools that they have used to be successful because there will be a snowball in the whole region. I think there were, uh, you know, a, a, a terrible brutality against uh, uh, the Syrian revolution to allow it to succeed. And we have been through uh, 10 years of severe trauma. It's a collective trauma. It's a whole nation that is living traumatic uh, experience out of the war that will take probably decades to, to, to be uh, solved, to heal from. So it's really hard for us to live, uh, to do the diagnosis now, or to uh, uh, understand, uh, look at what went wrong. We know the board lines of what went, went wrong, but really there were, you know, force majeure uh, against us, against the revolution, against the, uh, the protesters, the peaceful ones who wanted to build a, a better Syria. Uh, still, I don't. I don't say. I, I think it's a very important to introduce and to enforce the self-criticism. But we also have to acknowledge that what the Syrian people lived throughout the past ten years was unprecedented in its violence, in its brutality, its inhumane uh, brutality that was used against them, against uh, civic people, and against you know helpless women and children and elderly. And the world was watching and kept silent. That by itself is a, a, a major uh, a sense of disappointment that will add to the trauma that will need years to heal for the Syrians. Thank you. 
Yes, I may add that I think that we are very critical. Uh, for example, over the past three days, there was a room on Clubhouse, you know, the new Clubhouse, uh, discussing the mistakes of the Syrian opposition. And, and I felt that there was a lot of transparency in that. And uh, I believe that the, uh, the evidence that we are uh, very much, uh, you know, we go into diagnosis uh, in, a, in a very uh, courageous way on a daily basis is the new initiatives. Like like every every few every few days, there's a new Syrian initiative with new innovative ways and tools uh, to solve the problem. And every time, there's a lot of learning, and we need to look at you know in the past decade uh, to all this, the groups that turned into establishments and institutions, and and uh, you know they have governance models, and all that is only evidence that we we have frameworks and we have evaluation frameworks, and we are looking at impact and influence and what works and what's not but i want to say just one thing guys for the past it's been 10 years we haven't slept we are in an emergency situation we respond we react we uh, every morning there's a new uh, news uh, that no uh, human body can handle and you know we 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 take all those bombings in our, you know, um, the the simple, uh, the simple, uh, you know, the texture of our the of our. Um, the 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 skin. Hey, skin, like even our skin is receiving those bombs. And, you know, we cannot escape the, the emotional level. We cannot deny the emotional level. When we are asked to be objective about that, this, this means, uh, I mean, that, that as if it was a moment that disappeared and we need to reflect back. No, we still live in the moment. It's the, those 10 years hasn't, I mean, the, the revolutionary Syrian moment hasn't ended. We are still at the midst of it with the same level of commitment as day one with the same issues of the, of, uh, commitment of uh, with the same issues and problems of day one. And I feel that it's not our job to turn ourselves into an academic paper. Someone else should do that. I mean, we are so busy, uh, you know, uh, so busy, so busy uh, living, living that. Lisa, I just want to say, um, because I, I don't want to, I, I don't know, I, I just have the feeling that we uh, might be misunderstood or like that we want to close with the note that we want to burden ourselves from really this self-criticism. I think it's very needed. And I sh actually, I agree because we are doing it to an extent. Yeah. But so when I said it was a serious like uh, invitation to do something like because we were trying to focus on one topic, but the question of self-criticism and diagnosing our short diagnose our shortcoming, uh, short for sh short like comings and fall, falls, it's very important. And I I do believe that we are doing it to an extent, and we are still doing it. And I do certainly believe it's a cornerstone in uh, th this new narrative that we are uh, trying to create, you know, and uh, it's very important for us to keep moving. So it's not really uh, at, at all a uh, goal to, to say, no, we are, uh, we should avoid that or we cannot because there's such a heavy emotional burden on our shoulders, which is true by the way, but it's not a call that we, 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 we don't want to do that. We might not be, uh, be perfectly able to do it on the, uh, uh, according to some expectations, but uh, I think uh, we are doing it. And I think many people in different ways, levels are doing it. And I, there are actually some things written already or things even in the art scene. And I'm speaking about the art scene now, particularly. I see, I see uh, more and more works uh, trying uh, not to recall the past in nostalgic way, nostalgic way at all, uh, to be very critical and to try to, uh, to, to go deeper and try to, uh, to maybe reach uh, different conclusions. Uh, this this is essential. This is uh, this is very important, and it's it's a must. It's no, no doubt about it. Well, and I should just add here that Alma's curatorial practices, Lena's films and journalism, and your plays are already part of that diagnostic project. 
So uh, I think that's important to keep in mind here. I appreciate your courage and commitment and the analytic and artistic perspective you brought to bear on uh, at what should be an ongoing conversation. I hope we can invite you back to the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory. Uh, we've gone way over our time allotment and that is just a tribute to how engaging you guys are. And I really appreciate the, the difficulty of talking about these issues. Uh, somebody in the chat also reminded us this is the 10th anniversary, not of the Civil War, so-called, but of the revolution itself. And so uh, in appreciation of its ongoingness, Let's hope for uh, a better year. And uh, I want to thank you all for, for joining us and for those audience members who uh, stuck with us. And please join me from around the world in thanking our participants. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Lisa. you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. It was a great pleasure. Bye.